if you are a, a parent, because it's not just fathers that we want to celebrate today. We did not get to celebrate as a community um, Mother's Day. So if you are a parent, would you please stand up one more time, both mothers and fathers. Give them a wonderful round of applause. And we have a gift that we would like to give to you. Uh, a faithful brother in the Lord decided to provide these gifts. So Pastor Kang is going to make his way around to each of you. And please select one of those gifts for you. Um, and uh, uh, and if your, uh, your beloved is not here, then please pick another for them so that they can be able to have our gift of appreciation. We have such wonderful parents here. Um, and uh, and it's, it's so... It's, so wonderful to be a part of this community and to uh, to finally see faces, although they're covered by masks. Um, someday, someday, you guys are all going to be liberated from those things, and uh, and we're not going to worry about that any longer. Um, so once you get your uh, your present, you can you can be sure to uh, to have a seat. Um, so again, I'd like to wish all the fathers happy Father's Day. Um, happy Father's Day for everyone who is, uh, who is here, for all of you wonderful fathers. And to my father, I'd like to say, happy birthday. Um, my dad's uh, birthday was yesterday, so occasionally his birthday does fall on Father's Day, but we're going to celebrate with him both his birthday and Father's Day at my house later on today. So be sure to wish him a happy birthday as well. Um, if you want to know how old he is, he's 25 and holding. Um, so, uh, he'll be 25 until the day he dies. That's what he's sticking to. All right. So, um, so if you would be so kind, turn with me in your Bibles to, um, uh, Ephesians chapter six, Ephesians chapter six. Now I know the passage today says Genesis chapter 31, and indeed we are going to be there as I talk about today's message. However, um, as I was pouring over the text for today, I found a strong comparison with all of the problems that are happening in Genesis chapter 31 with not paying attention to the advice Paul gives in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, uh, a, a way to be able to, to give this sermon is to say not a happy goodbye. It certainly wasn't. But I was toying with possibly calling this sermon uh, title, How to Wreck Your Family. How to Wreck Your Family. Because as you read Genesis chapter 31, uh, and you do not think that this family is just so disgusting, then you've obviously missed the point. Um, uh, what has happened with Jacob and with Laban is just awful. And, uh, and we can make a, a study of how bad um, they are to each other in this text, in which we kind of will do. But I want to summarize that with Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 says this. And this is about as sound wisdom as I could possibly give to any children and any fathers on this day. Here it begins. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. But it doesn't just stop with children. Verse 4, fathers or parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So two imperatives are given in this passage, in this quick passage in Ephesians. Imperative number one or command number one is to children. Children, bad news, obey your parents. Okay? You need to obey your parents. I know that a lot of you live in, in sort of this struggle with your parents, especially in second generation um, immigrant families, where you look at your parents and you go, gosh, you're so Chinese, right? Or in my children's case, gosh, you're so Korean, right? You just, they just make some of their influences or make some of their decisions based upon that sort of Chinese mindset and philosophy. But children, doesn't matter what their culture is and whether or not they totally understand you, you're given a command. Children, obey your parents. Okay? But there's also a command that's given to parents. What is the, what is the command? The command is this. Fathers or parents do not provoke your children. 
Yes, they're supposed to obey you. But we as parents are not supposed to give them reason to be angry or frustrated with us. That's a dual command. And as we look at what honor is and is not and what provoking is or is not, through Genesis chapter 31, we're going to see that this command is so important because when we fail to heed it, we invite disaster into our homes. So let us look at a sad, sad family. And if for no other purpose, you should look at this family and praise God and say, thank God my family is not like this. We are not this bad. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 31, I'm not going to read the entire passage because it's 55 verses long. Okay? I don't think it would be to our advantage to be able to read it. So we're just going to go through it and you can be able to look at some of the verses and follow along as I have some of the translations that I did posted on the screen above. It begins with Jacob, and Jacob has now been informed of something that he did not intend to know about. It was not something that he enjoyed hearing about at all. In fact, it really concerned him, and that is this. If you remember, when we talked about Genesis earlier, the last where we left off, was that Jacob had been sticking poles, some striped, some spotted, some speckled, into the water supply, and whenever the sheep or rams or goats would go down to the rivers in order to drink and to procreate, okay, in order to have little ewes and little rams and little sheep and little goats, right? When they procreated, he would, in the healthy land, stick the poles with the stripes and the spotted and the speckled, somehow in order to try to encourage them to, to breed spotted and speckled children. Doesn't work out that way, but that's what he did out of a kind of superstition. Right now, when the weak lambs and weak goats went down in order uh, to, uh, to procreate, he decided not to do that. So they did not uh, uh, end up having uh, spotted, healthy children um, because he was worried that they, their children weren't going to be healthy at all. So he has been growing because his pay was these spotted, speckled, and striped animals. His flocks have been growing. Laban's flocks, the pure white ones, irony of ironies, that's what Laban means, white. His white flock began to dwindle. And Jacob's flock began to grow. Now, this started to create this kind of rivalry, especially amongst Jacob's brother-in-laws. And they started to say this. Jacob has taken, which is to our father. Jacob's wealth is from our death. He has stolen it from our father. And they began to add, as from which he has made all this abundance. So, Jacob is getting wealthy off of the backs of Laban and Laban's family, right? Now, obviously, there is a little bit of truth, but so much of it is just wrong. Because, one, Jacob wasn't stealing from Laban at all. And that's what the text is kind of indicating. That's what they're sort of subtly saying. You know how sometimes when Chinese parents say something, they don't say it directly, just kind of say it indirectly? Right? They're indirectly saying, Jacob has stolen our father's wealth. Right? So, so they're upset with Jacob. They're not treating him very well. And what made the situation even worse was that when Jacob then began to see Laban treating him a little bit differently. And he began to go, oh, oh, this is a problem. And the problem is, we're... I'm living with a father-in-law and now my other in-laws that are beginning to despise the fact that my wealth has increased and his wealth that I have taken care of has decreased. And knowing the type of man Laban is, this was a really, really big problem. Making the situation even more interesting was this fact. God showed up again, this time in a vision. 
God appeared in this vision in Jacob's dream. Now, we don't, in the description of the initial part of this vision, we don't know what the dream was about. All we know is what specifically God said. And God said this, You must proceed to return to the land your father and to your kindred, and it is my will that I will proceed to happen with you. Namely, what God is saying is this, You need to go home, and I am with you. Okay? Now, there's both some good news to this and some bad news to this. The good news is if Jacob goes home, that means he's leaving behind all the problems with Laban. That's great for him. He really, really likes that. But the problem is he has not yet in over 20 years heard anything from his mother Rebecca. Esau still, still seems to be fuming mad about Jacob. And to now go home is dangerous. But God promises, I will be with you. So Jacob begins to become a man. He begins to shoulder the responsibility that he has placed upon himself and realize that he needs to obey what God has said. And so he does what good men will do. He gets up and he tells his wives. Now, hopefully good men will just tell a wife. But in his case, he had, remember, four. Uh, two wives, two half-wives, two concubines. And so he is going to talk to uh, his wives, uh, to Rebecca, um, uh, or sorry, to Rachel and to Leah. So... He gets them together and he says this. He says, okay, I have had, I have a problem, right? And he first explains what the problem is. And he says, I'm seeing for these last few days, I'm seeing that the face of your father has changed. Now, I don't know if you get what that means, but I think intuitively you understand what that means. Like, for example, have you ever entered into the room with your parents' children? And just seeing your parents beam at you, like they're so proud of you. They're just like, oh, that, that's my boy, right? That, that's my girl. Have you ever felt that before, right? Have you ever felt the opposite of that? When you enter into a room, there's just a coldness. And you begin to think, okay, what did I do? Right? That's the reality of this face change. He has now entered into the presence of Laban, and Laban has a coldness to him. He is worried what your father is going to do to me. I have no idea what's going to happen to me. So he is telling his wife, okay, his wives. And then he begins to list sort of this case. He says, we need, I'm worried about this, but God has been with me, and here is the situation, okay? Case number one, he lays it out and he says, okay, you guys know I've worked for your father and I've worked hard, right? And he's hoping that they're all going to be like, yes, yes, yeah, we do know that. Charge number two, your father's tricked me. Your father's deceived me. Well, what has he done? What's the problem? Well, first, we all notice what happened to, uh, to him when, when he wanted first to work for Rachel for seven years. And, and Laban did a little bait and switch, right? He gave him Leah. Like, that was... Surprise, that was a change, okay? So he then had to work another seven years in order to get the woman that he wanted to marry, which was Rachel. So he has already changed his wages once. But then over the time, apparently, over the seven years, which we did not see, whenever Jacob said, okay, I want my wages to be the spotted sheep, right? And all of a sudden you had a bunch of spotted sheep. Laban said, oh, I didn't mean the spotted spotted sheep. I meant the speckled spotted sheep. So your wages are going to be these, the speckled sheep. Oh, okay, fine. And then it, when he said, uh, okay, my wages are the spotted, and all of a sudden we have more and more speckled sheep. Well, I didn't mean the, the speckled spotted sheep. I meant the striped ones. You, you're supposed to get the striped ones. And so Laban kept doing that. And whatever Laban said, Jacob's wages were supposed to be, apparently, Jacob got a bunch of those types of animals. And so God was simply allowing Jacob's wealth to grow. And Laban's wealth kept shrinking. So part of the situation is that God has intervened and God has specifically protected Jacob. Okay? 
And that's why he says finally in, in 31 verse 9, hey, every time he changed the wage, God intervened, right? And that's why my wealth has grown, and that's why now God is telling me we need to leave. And he says in verse 10 through 13, not only do I have a problem with your dad, but God has told me, right? Here's sort of the extra evidence, right? And so it's good enough when it's like we have plenty of reason to leave here, but God also said leave here. So yeah, we're going. Okay, so he says God showed up, and then in the beginning, in verse 10 through 11, he describes this dream that he had. And we don't know if that's actually the dream. Uh, we only have, have his word for it, and we don't have a lot of reasons for him to lie. But he says, hey, um, uh, God told me this in verse 12, that I've seen what Laban is doing to you, and I am the God of Bethel. God invokes, he doesn't say I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I am the God that you made a covenant with. Now, I fulfilled my end of the bargain. I've been with you. I've brought you to your family's home. I have increased your wealth, and now I'm going to bring you back home. That's what he's doing when he's invoking Genesis, in, in, in Genesis 31. Sorry, that's not 3, 31. In 31, 12 and 31, 13, he's saying, hey, remember what you vowed to me. And he says, now, here's the instructions. Get up, rise, go back to your family. And, and he gives us in 31, 13b, almost the exact same command that we saw earlier that's recorded in the vision. Okay? Now, this blows my mind. You ready for this? I... I when I read this and when I translated this, I couldn't believe it. The daughters, Laban's daughters, said to Jacob after all of this, you know, it, it's kind of like, hey, I'm, I'm creating this case. And I, I go to my wife and I say, all right, you know what? We need to do this. We need to do that. Right. And I'm laying out all the reasons why. Okay. I'm hoping that if I give everything to her, she's going to say, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. But they don't just say, yeah, we think it's a good idea. This is what they add to this. Sure, let's do it because here's their rationale. What's our inheritance? He's wasted all of our inheritance. Problem two, verse 15. Does he not think of us as an alien to him because he sold us? Do you get that? They are mad 21 years later that their father traded them for labor. They didn't get to make the decision. It was this business transaction they felt like property. And they said, You're, he gave us away. And then all the money that he earned, he wasted, he spent. So what's it to us? And then they acknowledge, verse 16, that God has snatched everything that is wealth in our father and he has given it to you. And that means to us and to our sons. So, yeah, if God says it, let's do it. You know, I would have wished that that's how they opened. If God says we should go, we should go. No, 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 no. It's our dad is so awful. Let's do it. What has happened here? What has happened is that their father has provoked his daughters to wrath. Parents, here's the first thing that I want to encourage you with today, and that's this. Children are provoked to wrath when they are treated like property. Children are provoked to wrath when they are treated like property. That's why his, his own daughters hate him. I, I, I'll tell you, my daughter does not feel that way about me. Praise God. Right? Holy cow. It, it, in fact, she says, you know, Dad, when I get married, I'm going to be crying so much at my wedding. Why? Not because she's going to get married and she'll be happy, but she's going to leave me. Oh. I love that so much. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about how, what Clara's response is going to be. She's going to be getting married awfully soon. Whether or not she, what she's going to do and react to this. But, but man, you know, it's, 
Laban's daughters? You, we, you, you say we need to go? Screw it, let's go. How do children feel like they're treated like property? Well, here's an obvious way. In a way, I don't think any of you, I pray that none of you are dealing with in your home, and that's abuse. When parents abuse their children, it forces their children to feel subhuman, like they're merely a thing to be toyed with, dealt with, and discarded whenever the parent doesn't like them. That makes them feel like property. And children who grow up in abused homes often become abuters, abusers later on in life. They repeat that cycle. So I pray that none of you have to deal with the issue of abuse. But let me give you a more subtle way for parents. Parents, your children will feel like property when you say this, and I know a lot of you have said this, what are other people going to say? What are other people going to say? Now, I know you're telling, you're telling me, parents, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, that's, that's something that we need to worry about, isn't it? Let me explain to you. And I know a lot of you understand this, but you don't understand this. It's like in Hebrew, I know a lot of you know it, but you don't know it, right? You don't yada this. Uh, let me explain to you how this works. Because living in this type of home, in a first generation, second generation home, I see this all the time. Children go or, or want to do something or they tell their parents they're going to do something. And the response of the parents is, whoa, 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 whoa. no, 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 you should not do that. But the rationale behind it isn't, is it right or is it wrong? It is, what are other people going to say? Now, the parents are thinking, hey, we live in kind of a collective society, right? This is not just about us. The, the Chinese culture, Korean culture, a lot of Asian cultures have what's called an honor culture. And when children do something that is inappropriate, it sort of brings shame upon the whole family, upon the whole community. An example of that was something that happened to one of my professors at Cal State Fullerton. Her name is Stella Ting Tumi. So she grew up in China. Her maiden name was Stella Ting. Right now, when she went off to study in America, her father, on the way to the airport for her to come to school in the United States, said, remember, Stella, you represent your family. Study hard. Right? And she went, okay, yeah. And then as they, they got closer to the airport, he said, remember, Stella, you represent your province. Study well. She said, okay, well, now I have my whole province on my back. And then he said, as she was leaving the car to board the plane, he said, remember, Stella, you bear the entire honor of the Chinese people. <laughs> All billion on top of her now. She's really got to make it. Okay? But in a Western culture, whenever we hear what other people were say, we're more individualistic. The response of your children who are born here will say, I don't care what other people say. Why would I care what they think? And here's what happens in the dynamic. You ready? When a child who doesn't want to hear what other people think are told by you, parents, what will others think? They feel like they have to operate as an accessory to you. You see how that works? They feel like I'm my goal in life is to just make you look good. And they get angry and resentful for that. Don't ever use what will other people say. Once Jacob got the okay, he was out the door. He is gone. Now, he tried to make sure that it was going to be the easiest on him. So what was going to be the easiest on him? The easiest for him would be that he sort of allowed some distance in order to exist between him and his father. He would wait for an opportune time, and then his whole family would be on the move. And so when that time came, he put his sons and, and his wives on camels, and, and he drove them off. And then he and some of his servants began to drive the livestock in order to try to keep them on a fast pace. And they started to move. Now, they didn't tell Laban what they were doing. 
Laban had no idea what was going on. In fact, verse 19, Laban is out shearing the sheep, which is really good for him. This is a perfect time for him. He's going to be really, really happy at this time because he's making money. When you're shearing sheep and you're taking off all the wool, that means you're getting a bunch of, of wool to be able to turn into cloth to be able to make um, uh, clothes so that you can be able to either sell the clothes or sell the cloth in order to make yourself rich. So he's going to be in a very good mood, which is a perfect time for Jacob's family to get out of Dodge. But here's the problem. While Laban leaves, Rebecca sneaks in to Laban's house and she steals something called the teraphim from her father. Now I know a lot of you are saying, what the heck is a teraphim, right? A teraphim is simply this. It's a house god. It's a house god. So here's the problem that I often have. A lot of people say that Jacob was instructed to come to Laban's house because Laban was a believer. Are you sure? He has teraphim in his home. He doesn't seem like a believer at all. He seems like someone who is practicing idolatry. And these teraphim were like, you might see them often sometimes in homes that of, of unbelievers, usually not uh, 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 about some specific God, unless it's possibly like a Hindu home. But maybe you might see pictures of ancestors and rice bowls or incense burning in front of them where they will make prayers to their ancestors in order to help them from the afterlife. That's often what is happening here. It is a type of worship where you have small statues representing a deity or family member that you pray to in order to help you make good, wise decisions. That's a teraphim. It's a house god. Rebecca steals them. Now, or Rachel, not Rebecca. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. What, what, why is Rachel stealing teraphim? The problem is we don't know from the biblical text. It doesn't say Rachel stole the teraphim because. So we have to do a little bit of guesswork. One of the reasons that Rachel might have stolen the teraphim is this. She might believe in them herself. And she might think, if I leave, I'm not going to be able to pray to these. So she starts taking them and putting them into her satchel or into her saddlebag because she wants to be able to, to still hold to this, this false religion. We, we get some possibility of that from, uh, from chapter 30, verse 14. Remember when she asked her sister for her mandrakes? And she wanted to probably cast some form of spell in order to make her more fertile. Okay. Um, so possibly she dabbles a little bit in this type of ancestral or small god worship. But here's the thing. This is the rub that I have. I don't think it's this because that piece of evidence is all the way in the beginning of chapter 30. The closest piece of evidence is this. Verse 15. Remember what she said? We were bought and sold. My dad loves these things. As a parting gift to my wretched father, I'm taking them. Can you imagine a daughter having that type of attitude to her parents? It unfortunately happens all the time. My own grandmother was so angry at her parents she refused to invite them to her wedding. It happens. Don't think it won't. Don't think it can't. She was so angry with her father, I think. She wanted to stick it to him one more time. Here's why. The very next verse, verse 20, it says this. Then Jacob proceeded to. Now, he didn't know, but when he got everybody moving, he stole the heart of Laban, the Aramean, on without having declared to him. Now, here's what some people assume. 
they say the heart is representing of someone's love. And Laban must have really loved his children. And so since he loved his children and his children uh, were now leaving without Jacob stay, saying, that was how he uh, had his heart stolen and that would make him really angry. I don't think that's it at all. Here's one of the pieces of evidence why it's not. When you use the word heart in Hebrew, it is not a reference to something that you love. It's a reference to something that you choose. The heart was the center of the will. How do you make your choices? How did Laban make his choices? Probably by praying to those teraphim. Rachel puts them in her satchel and takes them, meaning he steals the one way that Laban uses to be able to decide. They st he steals his will. And that makes him angry. You left without telling me, that's bad enough. You steal my gods, that is going to get Laban to go on the war path because she is not honoring her father. Kids, theft is one of the fastest ways that you can show your parents how much you hate them. It is. If you don't honor and you don't respect your family, stealing from them will clearly indicate to them, yeah, I don't honor you because you're taking from them. Now, the obvious way is stealing something that belongs to them. Stealing an object or stealing money, like a credit card or something, in order to be able for you to get the things that you want. Obviously, we would see that as really, really wrong. But here's another thing that can really cause your parents to be concerned. You might not realize how much it feels dishonorable to them. And that's this, when you waste resources. Understand, children, money doesn't grow on trees. Have you ever heard that expression before? Parents have to work and often have to work hard for money. And when you frivolously want to spend it on things that they don't think the family can afford, it makes them feel bad because we want to give everything that you, that you want. But sometimes we can't. And then, especially... When you're like, oh, I want, and you say, I want like, I don't know, music lessons. I want to learn guitar. I want to, I want to. And it costs money. And then three months in, you're like, oh, this is too hard. Forget this. I'm done. Wah, wah, wah. All that money that we invested in you, gone. As if it was stolen from us. It feels like you don't respect the hard work that it takes in order to be able to invest in you. Be careful, children, to not dishonor your parents' work. Laban's told, three days later, Jacob's gone. What? He took your kids. What? He took your idols. What? So when he finds out, he is ticked. And the reason why we know he's ticked is because Laban grabs his brother. Wait a minute. Why would you grab your brother? If I needed to do something, and I needed to do something now, and I grabbed my brother, who's over six feet tall. What does it probably mean I need him for? A fight. Why didn't he grab his sons? Because in a fight, you don't want your sons to die. Brother's okay. Not your children. He's preparing for a fight. Because Jacob just ripped him off. Ripped him off of something very valuable to him. So he proceeds to grab his brother, he proceeds to take off, and, and he pursues him seven straight days. So now they have been on the road for ten days. Three days, Jacob got the, the head start. He crossed 
um, the, uh, the Euphrates River. Laban finds out. He chases after him. He's pushing him so hard that it takes seven more days before he catches up to him finally on Mount Gilead or possibly Mount Gilead. We're not, we're not totally sure how to pronounce it. There's an I in there, which makes it difficult. But just before he catches Jacob, God shows up. The day before he meets them, God appears in a dream to Laban and says this, you better guard yourself. Don't speak with Jacob from good until evil. Wait, what? What are you saying, God? Oh, Laban could give Jacob the riot back. And when you're saying speaking from good till evil, it's where Laban gets to lay out every issue he has with Jacob. God is saying, this is not the time to do that. You don't get to tell him everything that's on your mind. Be careful. Guard yourself. Because I know you're going to want to. You ever been in that type of fight? Children, no, you haven't. Fathers, we have. Where we get into an argument possibly with our wife, our beloved, and then all of a sudden she wants to talk about everything. We're worried about the thing that started the fight. They want to bring up so much more. It happens. Much more than any one of us wants to admit. Jacob struck his tent on Gilead, which is about 400 miles away from Haran. He was making good time, which meant he was driving his children fast. And notice, it's 400 miles probably in a straight line. What does that mean he did? That means Jacob was so worried about getting rid of Laban, he went straight through the desert. He did not take the trade route. That's why he put his family on camels. Get through the desert quickly. That's why he stayed to drive the animals. To try to make sure he could keep as many of them alive as possible. My bet is not all of them made it. And he didn't worry about the ones who were left behind. He wanted to get out of Dodge. And finally Laban catches up with him. Because he doesn't have to worry about driving animals. In seven days. That's a pretty difficult pursuit and a lot of ground to make up. So they finally meet on Mount Gilead. When they meet on Mount Gilead, Laban says, what have you done? Notice what he says, and I have it here uh, in a different color for you. Then you proceeded to steal my heart. What was the first thing he said? You stole my heart. What did he not talk about? You took my family. He mentions it. Yeah. Second. Then you proceeded to drive my daughters as captives. Now, when Jacob learns, wait, I stole something from you. What? Jacob's probably a little incensed. And then the second concern is, and you, you know, pushed my daughters really hard through the desert because obviously you were running away, thief. Then he goes back. What have you hidden from me? Then you proceeded to steal from me. What is he more concerned about? What was stolen? Not his family. You left me? You didn't even let me kiss my descendants. Oh, that's nice. You bring them up again. But you've been intensely foolish. And then he says, and this is an odd expression, exists to God of my hand. What? God of my hand? Huh. Exists to a God of my hand to make evil with you. But the God of your fathers. That's a contract. That's a stark difference. God of his hands means he made his gods. He's referring to the teraphim. 
by their standards, stealing one of them would be equal to trying to steal God or the favor of God himself. That's a death sentence. He's saying, I have every right to bring evil upon you. But your God, not my God, not our God, your God, the God of your fathers, talked to me and said that I'm not allowed to speak to you about everything from good to evil. But what you have done. I know you wanted to go back home. I know you wanted to return to your family. But what you've done is you have stolen my God. Now clearly what Jacob did, the one thing that he did, was when he left, he did not want to tell Laban. He didn't even consider what Laban thought or felt. This is what made the situation worse. Do you understand? And children, when you want to dishonor your parents, when you want to destroy your home, just disregard all the feelings that your parents had. When children don't think about their parents' feelings, especially in this culture, it shows a tremendous amount of dishonor and disrespect. Consider the feelings of your parents. Here's an obvious way. When you refuse to listen. Oh, one time my son put his hands on over his ears when I was talking. Oh, made me so mad. That's an obvious way to say, you're not even concerned with what I'm saying to you. When you refuse to listen to your parents, that's the obvious way for you to reveal that you do not honor your parents. But here's another way. Being totally independent. When you make decisions, especially decisions for yourself, and you do not consult the wisdom of your parents. That is a way to show them that you don't really honor them. Let me give you an example. When I was in college, it was around my I don't know, sophomore or junior year, I would wake up probably around 9 o'clock in the morning. Usually be before 9 because I knew I had to be at school by 9.30. So it was somewhere around 8.30 and 9. By that time, my mother had already gone off to work in order to be able to teach at one of the schools that she taught at. Okay? I would stay at Biola University even though I was living with my family. I would stay at Biola University often until 11, 12, sometimes as late as 1 or 2 in the morning, studying. My job was at Biola, so I earned money there. And then I had to study in order to make sure all my homework was done. And I wanted to get it done at Biola so that when I came home, the only thing I needed to do was worry about sleeping. So I would eat at Biola, and I would come home, and I'd sleep at home. By the time I got home, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, my mom was already asleep. I was living my life, and my mom was never seeing me, even though I was living at home. Do you realize after about a month or two of that, my mother began to worry. She began to become concerned. What are you doing? What are you up to? What's going on with you? I didn't care. I was living my life. I was working hard. It didn't matter that I was never making contact with her. I was getting my work done. And so when she was getting a little antsy with me about, you know, why are you not, you know, why am I not talking with you? I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. I'm a good son. I'm working hard. I'm studying hard. My goal was to get straight A's. And I wasn't even Asian. But she, even though I was a good student doing well, wasn't happy because I wasn't ever connecting with her. And that's what she was longing for. And so whenever we talked, we were getting into fights, but it was because of my total independence from her and from my father and from their wisdom and input into my life. I'm still their son. So we started a practice. A practice, especially for you college students or those of you who are going into college, I would encourage you to adopt. Make an appointment to have at least one meal with your family 
every week. Just so that you can check in. And just by making that small correction, my mother felt honored. And then it soon incorporated my dad. And soon it became such a good time of us being together. We doubled it. We started to have dinner every Thursday night and every Sunday for lunch. And it became a good relationship building even though I was now becoming more and more of an adult and more and more independent. I could still honor them by seeking their input and influence into my life. I would tell them what I was doing, and then we'd talk about that kind of stuff. They could give me advice, and it was up to me as to whether or not I would choose to follow it, but it helped them stay connected to me. Total independence disregards your parents' feelings because they love you, and they want to stay close to you. Make sure you check in with them. Jacob didn't, it was clear. And when he heard Laban just list all these charges against him, he was like, what? Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. He said to him, I left because I was afraid. I was afraid that if I told you that I was going, I would leave empty handed. You would steal from me my wives, your daughters. No, I wasn't going to do that. But then he says this. And this is pretty dangerous. He doesn't know how dangerous it is, but it was pretty dangerous. He said, if you find your gods, because remember, that was mentioned over and over again, what he stole. If you find your gods amongst anyone in my company, that person will not proceed to live. I don't care who has them. You can punish that person with death. Now, probably what Jacob is thinking is that it's one of the servants. You know, the servants, their employees, they get little sticky fingers, right? Oh, I'll take some of these, huh? I could get some money, okay? That's what he's probably thinking. One of my servants probably took it, no big deal. Had no, what Bible says, had no idea. Rachel was the one to take him. Rachel was the culprit. So Laban then says, fine. And he starts to go through every single tent, starting with Jacob's. He goes to Jacob's tent, tosses it, can't find it. Then goes to Leah's tent, tosses it, can't find it there either. Then goes to the two uh, concubines, okay, Billa and Zilpa, right? Tosses their tent, can't find it. Then goes to the actual culprit. And Rachel, when she sees what her father, one, is doing, and then second, that Jacob said, you can kill anyone who stole the idols. She puts them in her saddlebag, the saddle that she normally sits on when she's riding her camel. And then she sits down on that saddlebag, and her dad comes in. And she says, as her dad is searching through all of her normal stuff, um... I'm sorry, Dad. Uh, I, I, it's, I don't want to get up in front of you, my Lord, because um, I'm, go, I'm, I'm experiencing the way of the woman. For those of you that don't know what that means, she was saying she's on her period. So she didn't want to stand up and, you know, have the little blood there. And so she was just going to sit there, if you don't mind. And her dad's like, fine, whatever. And he's searching through everything else. But because she never got up, he never could toss where the gods actually were. And when he comes out empty-handed, oh, Jacob is mad. And he kind of has a right to be. Because Laban didn't know what happened to his gods. But what was the first thing he did when he had the chance? He blamed Jacob. Parents, if you want to provoke your children to wrath, cast blame. Blame them for things. That'll make them extraordinarily angry with you. The obvious is when you scold them, right? I have a rule. It's my personal rule. You can follow this rule if you want to, or you can say, Pastor Daniel, you're whacked. No way. I'm not going to do that. But this is my rule. My rule is this. If I scold my children 
that's their punishment. I don't get to do anything else to them because I scolded them. Okay? They've already gotten an earful. For me to do anything else now compounds the problem. So if I raise my voice and I'm angry with them, that's their punishment. If I want to do something else, then I cannot scold them. I simply tell them, you did this, this is the consequence, and then I give them the consequence. Whether it's taking something or grounding them or something like that. But if I scold them, I don't get to do another punishment. It's an obvious way, scolding is an obvious way that we create blame. Because when you scold and punish, now it's a two for one. But I'm getting punished, but I'm also having to endure this lecture. Wait a minute. Why am I getting punished twice? Right? It's going to provoke your children. Trust me. When you're assigning upon them blame. But here's a subtle thing. It's more subtle. Parents, often, when you get into uh, disagreement with your children, you want to support your case. Don't support your case by bringing up all the things they did in the past. Sometimes we can go way back, years even, in order to say, I don't want you to behave like this because you did that when you were five. Okay, but they're not five anymore. Right? Be careful. Don't bring up stuff from the past. Focus on the present and dealing with the present situations that you're facing. Okay? So Jacob and Lodes, you came empty hand. You came all this way to chase me down because of those precious gods. And what would you find? Yeah, nothing because I didn't take them. So the moment Lake Laban comes out, I can just imagine him going like, okay, so where are they? Yeah. I didn't take them. I didn't take them. And now you've gotten to grope everything. That's what it means because you've groped all the vessels. You've gotten to grope everything that actually belongs to me. But did you find anything? No. That's why you and I, we need some space. And now he starts bringing it up. Last 10 years I've worked for you. You have, cha- you, have, you have been so abusive. He says, over those last 10 years, I haven't done one thing that was bad to you. Which he says, not one of your lambs miscarried. Now, here's the, here's the deal. He lists out this whole thing. He talks about a miscarriage. He talks about eating the rams. He talked about torn flesh. What that means is this. You're a shepherd. You're out in the field. You're all alone. You're getting a little hungry. You have all this prime meat in front of you. And there is nobody watching. You can always kill a ram or kill a sheep or kill a goat and have a tasty meal. And when you get back, you can always show like a leftover hoof and say, yeah, I'm sorry, a lion got to it. This is all that's left. Poor Blackie. Right? And it's not like they have anything to say. They weren't there. Jacob is saying, I didn't do any of that to you. I didn't even show up. And if you lost any of your animals, you required me to pay you back. You blamed me for it. So I I lost sleep over this. I was out working for you in the heat of the day. I was out working for you in the chill of the night. Over these last 20 years. And remember, he told this to his wife. And you kind of wonder, is, is he really, you know, did this really happen? He said, and you changed my wages 10 times. Now, honestly, if Laban didn't do that and this wasn't true, now is his chance to defend himself. And he never does. The only reason Jacob concludes that I have any of the wealth that I have is because of God. Well, that's nice. He's, he is finally getting it here. He says in verse 42, God has seen to prove you yesterday. I'm here because of God. 
and you're not killing me because I'm God. I had every reason to be afraid of you, and you had no reason to blame me. Parents, here's my final piece of advice. Don't provoke your children by not being a prayer. Do everything you can to make sure what you're doing is just. The obvious way to show when something is not fair is when you have favorites. Do you have favorites? My kids were talking about it the other day. They concluded that Samantha is my favorite and Josiah is my wife's favorite. <laughs> Hopefully that means we're pretty balanced. We try not to have favoritism in my home. But if children sense, if they even get a sense of favoritism, if they perceive that you love someone more than them, oh, that will produce bitterness in their soul faster than anything. Don't do favorites. But here's a more subtle thing. Dads, let's talk for a second. How selfish can we be? I'm, because I'm a dad, I know. Wife sometimes cooks a meal. We sometimes barbecue steak, and we have our eye on that big, juicy piece. <laughs> it's mine. Now, it doesn't help that sometimes our wives encourage it. Well, he's the adult. He's the dad. You know, ugh, respect your father. And it's just like, you know, sanctioned selfishness. Are you sometimes taking for yourself more than you're willing to give to your children? If you're looking out for your own interests first, parents, this is all parents. If you're locking out for your own interests first, when you hear yourself saying things like, I can't because, and it's not a reason like there is something else more pressing to do, but I am tired, I am hurting, I don't want to, right? That is saying to your children, I matter more than you. And that will make them feel you're not fair. No matter what you do. Jacob said, we need some separation. Laban says, that sounds like a good idea. But first he gets in his legs. Jacob just unloaded on him. His turn. He's going to unload a volley himself. And he says this. Your daughters are my daughters. Your flocks are my flocks. Every single thing you have is because of me. No. But kind of. But then he sw switches on the nice face and he says, but now to you, we, let's cut a covenant, shall we? Let's cut a covenant between you and me. Let's make sure that we leave on good terms. And so Jacob says, fine. And so he does what he did when he made a covenant with God. He takes a stone and he raises it like a pillar. And now he says to everyone there, go gather your stones, pile them up on top of this stone and let's eat. And so they did. They ate together. They sacrificed to God on that pile of stones. Signifying that what was happening, what was going to happen, was a spiritual covenant between them for all of time. And that's why it became known as Gilead or Gilead, however you want to pronounce the Ayan. Um, it got that name because Gilead, Gil means pile, and Ad, the Ayan uh, with the Ad sound, right? means witness. It's a pile of witnesses. All those stones. An enduring witness to say what the relationship was going to be with them. And Laban says, let Yahweh guide it. Let Yahweh keep watch. Let Yahweh make sure that all of this happens. And so he says, kind of the warning bit. If you humble my daughter, if you take other women and you make them over my daughters, you're nothing to me. Well, that's kind of status quo now, honestly. 
nothing. He was kind of nothing to him. But it was just a little extra threat. Just to, you know, keep him on his toes. But he said, this heap is a witness. I'm not going to go to you. You're not going to cross over to me to do evil. You can come to me so I can say hi to my grandchildren. But only to play nice. I won't be coming to you. And then what did Laban do? He rose up early in the morning. He kissed his grandchildren. He blessed them. And he left. So in the very end, it at least seemed civil. But would you really want to be a part of that family? Thank God we're not. Thank God we're not. Why? Why was that family so bad? It all ties back to what we learned as we started this message in Ephesians. What produced all the broken relationships is the children didn't honor their parents. And the parents provoked their children. When you do things like steal from your parents or not care about their feelings. Children, you're not honoring them. You're telling your parents that they don't matter. And it hurts. And parents, when you blame them, when you are unfair, when you treat your children like property, you provoke them to anger and bitterness and wrath against you. And they don't want to listen to you. And when they can, they will walk away from you. Praise God, I, I didn't have parents like that. They weren't perfect by no stretch of the imagination. But I still to this day have a loving, faithful relationship with them Largely because I had wise adults telling me how to nurture that relationship. Parents, you have a lot of wisdom in this church. A lot of pastors who are willing to help you and walk with you to raise godly children. Take advantage of their advice as well. We have some success. Pastor Brian and his wife. Pastor Kang and his wife would love to be able to make sure they can walk with you through this as well as lay leaders like Connie. You don't have to do this alone. Children, you also have godly examples. Pastor York, you've heard a little bit of his testimony. He's walked where you're walking. Don't discount his advice. I've been there too, though not Asian. I have plenty of experiences with an Asian family. You have Clara and Christina and Connie and Roy, all older brothers and sisters that love you and want you to walk in the graciousness of our great God. Don't turn your back on them. Use them to build a godly family that can endure, praise God, much as mine has. Because here's the last secret. You ready? For all of us. When we make Jesus the most important part of our life, and we build our relationships with others, most importantly, including our families, and then we worry about ourselves last, that spells joy. And joy will be in your family. Let us pray together. Father God, thank you for fathers. For men who have dedicated themselves to raise up children in the church. Especially those who faithfully come, those who listen online, those who, who encourage their family in the QT, 
and desire spiritual growth among them. Challenge their children to show up to the cell groups and to participate in the ministries of the church. God, thank you for fathers. And God, thank you for mothers. Mothers who work tirelessly, often both out of the home in a job and in the home to provide for their children. To take care of needs. To fix meals. To organize schedules and, and, and plan out the, the necessary education that all children need. And yet still find time to pray for their children. And to seek to their spiritual growth. Lord God, thank you for mothers. And Lord, thank you for children. They are not just our future, they're our present. Thank you for those that want to live godly lives. That seek you. That show up faithfully to cell groups and engage and and, and, and desire to learn. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. Thank you, God, for our children. And Lord, I just want to pray for these godly families. May you continue to be with them, encourage them, strengthen them. May they never lose heart or hope. Yes, the road is hard. Life is difficult and challenging. But God, you are good. And so we have a kind of map in front of us. Lord, we don't want to be like the family of Laban and Jacob. God, we want to be different. So may we practice those commands in our homes. May our children learn to obey their parents. May they honor them when they grow up. And may they have relationships with them, good relationships throughout their entire life. And Lord, may our parents not provoke our children to wrath. May we seek to love them and care for them. And may our children know, know that they are deeply loved. Father God, we want you to be the God of our homes, the God of our fathers, the God of our mothers, and the God of our children. Because only when you are on your throne do our families have a prayer and a sinful world. We want to put you first, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for being a great God, the God of Bethlehem. God that keeps his promise. Lord, may we keep ours. We pray this in your precious and holy name, the name of Jesus.